Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started. On behalf of Feed the Future, the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and the AgriLinks team, I would like to welcome you to our seminar on the latest Feed the Future impact evaluation. Um, and we are excited to share some new evidence on water governance, training, and gender in agriculture uh, drawn from a multi-pronged study conducted in Tajikistan. The finding, findings have relevance to a broad swath of food security development programming, and so I hope it will have some relevance for all of your work uh, here today. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I'm your host with the AgriLinks seminar and webinar series. So if you ever have a question about AgriLinks or our webinars, please come to me. I'll be facilitating the session today and moderating the Q&A. So before we dive into the content, just a couple of reminders. First, this session is being recorded, and we'll send the recording out to all of the registrants. Second, we'll be taking a few questions between each speaker and also a few at the end. And so if you'd like to ask a question in the room, please just raise your hand and wait for us to pass you a microphone. And this will help the online audience hear your questions. And I would also like to give a shout out to our online audience. We're expecting a large crowd today, and we're always thrilled when people can join us from all around the world. Lastly, my most classic reminder is to please silence your cell phones in the room in person so that we don't interrupt speakers. All right, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, who will give an introduction to the content and its uh, relation to the Feed the Future initiative, and who will introduce our other speakers. So Tatiana Pulido is our unit leader for the Feed the Future Country Monitoring, or for Feed the Future Country Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And she also serves as a technical advisor on market systems and metrics for the Feed the Future initiative and for Uganda, Rwanda, and Tajikistan. And importantly, her responsibilities include managing or management of two five-year impact evaluations on the effectiveness of key Feed the Future investments in Uganda and Tajikistan, including the one we're going to discuss today. So Tatiana. Thank you, Julie. Let me just move this down a little bit. For the introduction, uh, as uh, Julie mentioned, my name is Tatiana Polito. I want to welcome everyone today uh, to the presentation on uh, our findings of Feed the Future Tajikistan's impact evaluation that looked at the effectiveness of USAID's uh, work around water users associations and the impact we had on crop diversification, land cultivation, gender, as well as the sustainability of these institutions. A little bit more about my background, as Julie mentioned, I am the team leader for monitoring, evaluation, and learning Feed the Future country support in the Bureau for Food Security. Uh, my team is responsible for providing m and &E technical and advisory services to our 35 USAID operating units uh, overseas implementing Feed the, the Feed the Future initiative. <clears throat> I'm also one of the initial designers, part of the, the design team of this evaluation, and have managed it since its inception five years ago. I won't speak too long because I really want to leave a lot of time for the presenters and for a robust discussion, uh, but I did want to provide a bit of a background uh, to you all uh, regarding uh, where this work fits into the broader initiative's uh, goals. So back in the beginning of the initiative in 2011, we commissioned a series of impact evaluations to generate further evidence as to what worked and didn't work uh, for uh, food security uh, investments. <clears throat> and this evaluation is one of those uh, that was commissioned under this scheme. We were especially interested in Feed the Future USAID's Tajikistan programming, which during phase one of the uh, initiative focused on three key pillars, assisting households and small commercial farms in increasing incomes and food production to improve the nutritional and health outcomes, uh, developing capacity of local institutions and community-based organizations, and completing effective agrarian reforms in a select districts in Hotlong province. This area is located southwest uh, in Tajikistan, bordering Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. You will also probably hear it referenced throughout the presentation as the Feed the Future Geographic Zone of Influence, or ZOI. And so in, in the, uh, <clears throat> back in 2013, uh, we partnered with the International Water Management Institute to complete the design uh, and implement this design of the evaluation. And our interest really lied around a, a series of questions, first and foremost uh, around 
what distinguished our interventions, our creation and strengthening of water users associations uh, approach versus non-USAID approaches in the country. And more importantly, were these approaches uh, gearing up these institutions to remain sustainable and viable after we started withdrawing support. We also were interested very much then in how this water users associations would impact crop diversification, crop choices, and land cultivation. And finally, in a country that experiences a lot of male migration to Russia, we were very much interested in understanding the relationship of women vis-a-vis uh, these water users associations and more broadly uh, in these rural areas uh, around agriculture. The findings presented here not only speak to the legacy uh, that Feed the Future USAID leaves behind through its phase one uh, strategy in Tajikistan, but it will also inform our next phase of programming, uh, which will be done with uh, in cooperation with the initiative and under the USG uh, Global Food Security Strategy. If you're interested in learning more about the research, you want to read full reports, which are available in English and in Russian, want to see the surveys, or read some of the journal articles that have been published that take a deeper dive into specific features or facets of this work, I encourage you to uh, go to our impact evaluation landing page on agrilinks.org. Uh, so with that, I wanted to introduce the team uh, uh, from the International Water Management Institute who will be speaking today. Uh, first, it will be Joseph Price. Uh, he is a research fellow with IMI, followed by uh, Somya Balasumbramanya. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, she's uh, a senior researcher and environment and development uh, economics uh, <clears throat> advisor for the International Water Management Institute. And Marie Charlotte Buisson. She's a researcher at Environment and Development Economics, uh, also with the International Water Management Institute. And then at the end of the presentation, we will have some concluding remarks uh, by Dr. Ted Horbelik, who is the lead economist in uh, inter the International Water Management Institute. So with that, let me then turn it over to our first presenter, uh, Joseph. Okay, good morning, and thank you for the introduction, Tatiana. Thank you for joining us today, and thank you for USAID and, um, and AgriLinks for organizing the event. And it's a pleasure to be here to present some of our research to you. And so I'm going to begin by talking about enablers and challenges for water institutions in Tajikistan, which will then lead on to Samia and Marie Charlotte's presentation afterwards. So to begin with, I'm going to lay out my three top takeaways, and I'll structure my presentation around this. So firstly, for new institutions, newly designed water institutions, the length of training provided can be a key factor. However, even the best designed institutions often meet a complex local political and economic environment on the ground. So as a result, new institutions must recognize traditional and informal forms of governance, which poses the question, should all aspects be formalized, and what options are there to coordinate different institutional systems of water governance? So, Recent institutional change in Tajikistan must be traced back at least as far as the fall of the Soviet Union, where collective farms were broken up and the destructive civil war ensued throughout the 1990s um, as, as Tajikistan was becoming an independent state. And um, so during this civil war, it led to a, a kind of lack of availability of technical irrigation skills. Um, it degraded um, irrigation infrastructure and essentially created a governance vacuum for water management at the local level in Tajikistan. So in response to this challenge, uh, USAID worked closely with the government of Tajikistan, um, and they established the Water User Association Law in 2006, which would um, lead to the establishment of several hundred water user associations, which I'll refer to as WUAs from now on, um, across Tajikistan. And so WUAs are essentially a community-based participatory water management body, which um, which are responsible, legally mandated and responsible for governance functions at the local level, namely water delivery to private farms, routine repair and maintenance of secondary canals, collection of irrigation fees, which they then transfer to the government, a collection of WUA membership fees, and resolution of conflict among water users. 
And um, the introduction of water user associations in Tajikistan kind of follows a global trend in water governance of the decentralization and democratization of water institutions. And it's widely accepted that for these participatory institutions of collective action to function, to function smoothly, they require cooperation among its members, as it, after all, they're participatory institutions. And so it's widely accepted that training is therefore required when the institutions are being established to ensure that farmers are ready, prepared, and interested in sustaining a war institutional system. So as mentioned, um, both USAID and non-US, both USAID and other um, development agencies in the government of Tajikistan established wars in Tajikistan. And the wars were established using the same training materials, the same style of training, training financial management matters, technical irrigation management matters. But the key difference between the two groups of wars, the non-USAID wars and the USAID wars, was the length of training uh, provided to the farmers. So USAID wars received 20 to 24 months of training, compared to just three to six months of the non-USAID counterparts. So based on this fact, we thought it would be interesting to pose the question, do new wars with longer training perform their mandated functions better than those with shorter training? And this was kind of grounded in the literature and theories that postulated um, rapidly applying a blueprint design may not fully account for some of the nuances of community-based water management. And conversely, when there's brief training sessions or without sufficiently lengthy training, farmers may perceive, perceive training to be patronizing or may that not, may they may not be ready or interested in, in being involved in, in water governance in, in the water user association. And elsewhere in the world, um, the literature told us that in Dominican Republic, for example, where wars are established, uh, eight years of training led to very successful and serviceable institutions, which led one scholar to conclude that the longer the project, the longer the success. Whereas conversely, in countries such as Egypt, um, Azerbaijan, there was an undefined or shorter length of training provided to farmers, which was associated with more dysfunctional uh, institutions that were not effective at uh, fulfilling their mandated functions. So in Tajikistan, we carried out a census of 74 USAID and 67 non-USAID wars to compare them, to compare their performance between the two groups, between two points in time. And we used performance indicators that were based squarely on, on the legally mandated functions that I outlined in the first slide. So we used a modified difference in difference technique to compare the performance between 2014 and 2016, two points in time. And if anyone's interested, there's further detail of the methodology in this paper that we wrote that was published this year in, uh, in Water Economics and Policy. So, so our key findings from this investigation in Tajikistan were as follows. So we found that wars with longer training do indeed perform the mandated functions better than those with shorter training. And in particular, in particular we found that they recovered membership fees from 19% more of their members. They were 10% more likely to hold board meetings for planning activities before the start of the irrigation season. And they carried out routine repair and maintenance of irrigation canals more frequently than the non-USAID counterparts, which received shorter training. So what are the implications of this? So, so kind of broadly and methodologically, these data-based estimates provide uh, useful empirical evidence on how a policy intervention influences the performance of new institutions in their early days. And this is useful for short-term adaptive management, but also for future empirical assessments against which to compare the dynamics at that point in time. However, while we've identified here training to be an important factor in improving war performance, there are wider contextual considerations that exist in countries such as Tajikistan, which cannot be ignored. And I'll now go into some of the specific challenges which influence the functioning of water user associations and which potentially challenge their sustainability and compromise the overall goal of providing food security for different water users in the country. And the first of these challenges, which really underpins a lot of the issues, is the profound increase in male migration to Russia in recent years in Tajikistan, which has led to, in turn, an increased importance of household kitchen gardens, which are often tended by women and are small plots of land attached to household households, which are used cultivate um, subsistence crops such as vegetables and fruits, but also increasingly cash crops. And the key thing here is that, as mentioned, wooers are legally mandated to provide water to private farms, so private farms can become members of wooers, whereas kitchen gardens cannot become a member legally of the Water User Association. And instead, 
they receive their water and water-related services through informal and traditional forms of governance, which I'll go into in a bit more detail. So to understand the detail of these interactions between the different institutions and different water users, our qualitative research was guided by the proposition that policy making and policy implementation do not occur in a vacuum. Rather, they take place in more complex political and social settings where there are various institutions, various actors contesting and interacting in complex ways with different power dynamics shaping the rules of the game. So it's often the case in, in contexts like Tajikistan that there are hybrid arrangements of governance in place, so whereby um, new institutions like Wu's don't simply discreetly play, replace the form of old forms of governance and traditional practices. And especially in post-Soviet states, uh, one scholar notes how rules and organizations established by the state or international donor organizations can often be undermined by informal institutions. However, she highlights how these institutions don't have to be an obstacle to reform, but can also support new policy endeavors, such as the introduction of rules. So bearing all this in mind, in Tajikistan we found some interesting interactions between the kitchen gardens, the village committees, and water user associations. So as mentioned, just to emphasize again, there's no legal mandate for, for WUA membership for kitchen gardens, so they, there's no legal requirement for them to receive um, water via the water user associations. And instead, um, they receive water through village committees or village leaders who have traditionally been very active in Central Asia and Tajikistan in a broad variety of community-related affairs, including water dispute resolution and other kind of social securing functions. And so they, they're the governance mechanism, they're the form of governance that ensure that kitchen gardens receive water. And there are many informal arrangements in place between the village leaders and the water user association leaders, which ensures, in some cases, that kitchen gardens enjoy an equal right to water alongside the private farms. However, um, farms are a relatively new construct, as mentioned, and kitchen gardens are a traditional source of food security. This is just to highlight their importance. And they may account for 60% of water use in some settings in Tajikistan. And, but there are, there are conflicts between the different water users, between the kitchen gardens and the private farms. And in these cases, due to their, their role in providing water for kitchen gardens and their traditional role of authority and mediation in Tajikistan, the village leaders play a significant role in conflict resolution uh, in practice. So in some cases, um, the importance of kitchen gardens may be understood by the wooers who have different mechanisms, informal mechanisms often to link with the village leaders. And they will in some instances, form um, a plan and collaborate closely to prevent or resolve conflicts over water from escalating. And one example that we found in the field was um, in one village, there's an agreement on an irrigation schedule based on the zoning area covered by the Wua. And so that both farms and gardens would receive water simultaneously when it is their turn to irrigate. And this was formulated by the, the Wua leader and the village leader working closely together. However, um, What's clear from our research is that the government, governance arrangements do vary um, quite profoundly between different settings in Tajikistan. There's not a uniform model of governance that works the same way in every setting. So this varies from, in some contexts, um, village leaders have a lot of local authority and they sit on the WUA conflict resolution committee, so very closely integrated with the WUA institution. Um, elsewhere, USAID initiated up front some written agreements between the village committees and the wars to ensure coordinated governance and to ensure that the different water users were cooperating closely. In other places, there are no, no formal agreements, but just a kind of informal tacit recognition of the importance of kitchen gardens in Tajikistan. Whereas elsewhere, there are, there are cases where there's a lack of coordination and conflict. And this really kind of leads to the key issue from this part of the presentation that whether the necessary government's arrangements will survive informally uh, to ensure that the kitchen gardens are included in the water governance process and receive water adequately, or whether there are various strengthening mechanisms that are needed or formalization of some of the, some of the mechanisms I've talked about to ensure the kitchen gardens are sufficiently provided for. And so amongst all this, I think the focus needs to remain on different institutions and different water, water users being able to function effectively and cooperatively to reduce trade-offs between the different production systems, both of which are important, as I've highlighted. So to that end, I will end this part of the presentation um, by providing two concrete recommendations, kind of encompassing the quantitative findings I found and some of these contextual challenges I've talked about. So firstly, 
As mentioned, the length of training provided to water governance institutions is found here to be a key factor and should be a key factor in program design. As, as outlined, USAID provided longer training to WUs, and this was associated with better fulfillment of legally mandated functions. However, since there are these contextual challenges that I've talked about, there are various options for strengthening or formalizing coordinating mechanisms between the different institutions and the different water users. And one option that we've discussed, um, which could be worth considering, is um, bringing kitchen gardens into war membership, which would obviously have the benefit of increasing coordination between the different uh, actors and interests, but may also have the added benefit of increasing um, the revenues of wars through them paying membership fees, and this would potentially um, lead to a more sustainable war system in the future. So I'll end it there and open up for any questions at this point. Thank you so much, Joseph. Okay. Uh, so we're going to take a couple of questions between each speaker, and um, so if anyone in the room has a question, please raise your hand, and we'll also take some from our online audience. Yeah. Pass over the mic. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, I'm Laura. I'm from Bureau for Food Security. So I had a couple of questions. I know it was a short presentation, so mm -hmm. I probably need to read your paper on the water user associations. But I was wondering if you could comment, um, had both groups been in existence for a similar amount of time? And um, were the type of trainings between the short term and the long term similar, or were they completely different? And then also, the differences that you presented were sort of 19% difference in um, membership collection. But does that justify like that extensive amount of training afterwards? I'm wondering if it's like worth the investment is kind of what I'm, mm -hmm. I'm getting at. So okay. anything you could provide on that would be great. Thank yeah, you. sure. So yeah, in terms of the two different groups, um, so USAID provided the blueprint for training um, for all water user associations, which was used by non-USAID water user associations as well. So they were, everything was the same in the training, as far as I understand, apart from the duration of the training provided. So that was the key difference that we found. And we thought we'd base our question on that. And so they, and they were all established kind of from 2009 onwards. Um, so again, yeah, so we, so we kind of created a baseline at 2014, measured again at 2016 to compare the two different groups between these two different points in time. Um, and sorry, what was the second part of your question again? I think it, uh, excuse me, it was about the um, the uh, membership fees and the cost benefit of what was that piece? So you found oh, yeah, you found differences, but it, yes. I, I'm unclear if those differences, if you had sort of from your more extensive knowledge and idea, mm. if those differences really justified, you know, maybe two years more of the training investment yeah, costs, sure. or if there was a chance for. Got you know, it. you thought others could catch up on their, on their yeah. own. Yeah, I think so. This, it's important to emphasize that this is an assessment kind of in, in the institution's early days. So it's not kind of possible to say this is the sweet spot. This is the amount of training concretely that's needed. Um, but it's kind of just sets, I mean, it's a useful base of evidence that can be used to kind of inform potentially future decisions and gives an indication at best that um, the longer training is associated with with um, improved fulfillment of legally mandated functions. But yeah, at this stage, it's not possible to say 16 months is a sweet spot, or 20 months is a sweet spot that's needed for training. Um, so I guess this would kind of encourage future research to delve deeper into that. Um, so we'll bring up Samia for some extra comments. Uh, to just to add a little more to what Joe said, I think it's right, it's hard to know what that sweet spot is and the literature really doesn't know whether it's, we're talking 12 or 14 or 16 months. Uh, but to just to give you a bit of a sense, this, uh, this particular study is it's data in gravity schemes in, 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 in Tajikistan where uh, the treatment groups are the USA uh, wars and the control groups are the government wars. Now, the World Bank has set up water user associations, just in a different part. It's not part of the study area. And their training programs are about three to six months. And their costs of training per war, I don't know the numbers off my head, are not significantly higher than what USAID's costs per training were. So um, while we don't know what that perfect sweet spot of training length would be, uh, 
it seems to me, based on the limited information that we have on what the costs for training were, and it's, it's sort of based on how records were maintained, these trainings may not, be, may not have been that much more expensive as folks may think they have been. I think that's essentially what we, we, we found out. And, and that's the reason why I think it's important, we think that it's important to focus on the length of training and try to sort of, and, and perhaps document training costs better so that, that that particular question can also be answered in terms of cost effectiveness, if at least not cost benefit, but at least in terms of cost effectiveness. So, yeah, just that. Uh, Oh, you should continue. All right. Um, I'll pass it back to our online audience. Or, or no? Okay, we'll wait till we get one. Sorry, we're getting our mics uh, fixed a little bit in the room here. So I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, we might have to switch mics. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. So we have a nature of the uh, um, kitchen garden um, activity, so feel mm -hmm. free to put this down the line if this is addressed in the other presentations. Mm -hmm. um, the first is, do you have a sense of um, sort of the breakdown between um, the consumption versus the income generating part of kitchen gardens? Because I would imagine that those two different objectives would have different motivations and would um, affect the nature of the participation in OWUA. And the second question I have is, um, since I'm familiar with kitchen gardens primarily in sub-Saharan Africa, is there a movement toward um, uh, going from individual household plots to more of a collective arrangement, given that that would give more bargaining power, especially if we're uh, talking about women's groups? As I mentioned briefly at the start of the presentation, as Tajikistan used to be part of the Soviet Union, there were the collective institutions during this period, but then they were broken down, and the primary plot type was the private farms that were established, and kitchen gardens were kind of the plots that were kind of there to pick up the pieces, especially during the Civil War. They were increasingly important then. Um, but I think, the, yeah, the trend has kind of been away more from the collective plots since the fall of the Soviet Union, and the private farms were the types of um, plot that were promoted more, more heavily. And I think, did, Samia, do you have some specific figures on the percentage of... Yeah. Yeah. So I'll let Samia address the first part of the question. Do you want to take that? Yes, in terms of how the the herbs from the kitchen garden are used, well, it's mostly, or I should say, even un almost entirely kept for self-consumption. So what we call this uh, decan farm, or really commercial farm, where the herbs are sold on the market, but the kitchen garden are really the one that uh, will feed the household. Uh, the, the private farms are cotton and wheat systems. So cotton is usually cultivated for sale, and wheat is mostly for self-consumption. They may be a little bit for sale. And the kitchen gardens are mostly vegetables and fruits and other sorts of high-value crops, mostly for household consumption. But there seems to be the case that at least for about uh, about 10 to 11 percent of households, sale of, uh, uh, so for a small percentage of households, sale of produce from the kitchen garden also happens to be an important income source. So, but it's mostly for self-consumption, so it directly feeds the needs of the household. So it's an important food security uh, system in a sense. Great, thank you. I'll throw it back to our online audience for one question before we move on to our next speaker. All right, so we've got over 100 people online that have been um, submitting questions. And we have one from, um, we have one from Rebecca who asks, if these findings match with other evaluations in other locales, how much of the results are Tajikistan specific and how much are uh, general generalizable? Okay. I can take that. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think there are, and we will cover this towards the end of our presentation when our final speaker, Ted, will talk about what are the implications of uh, some of these results beyond Tajikistan. So I don't want to steal his thunder by making those points out here, but I think thinking about longer training, thinking about more integrated program development, thinking about the larger context and what larger context interventions are working under, I think become important in terms of thinking about program design. So yes, some of these results, as you will see uh, through the course of this presentation, 
uh, do have relevance for context beyond Tajikistan, especially in many countries where men are migrating and women are coming into agriculture. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to Samia for the next portion of the presentation. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to present results um, that really focuses around, that makes a case for increasing capacities and capabilities of female uh, Tajik farmers in order to sustain participatory water governance, which is an important component uh, for food security in Tajikistan. Um, and the top takeaways are, the punchline of the arc is really this. A participatory irrigation in Tajikistan has trained male managers and this program design is not uncommon. We see this program design in many parts of the world where lead farmers, who are mostly male, are trained and whose capacity in either water governance or agricultural extension is increased. But with rapid male migration, females are increasingly operating farms, and none of these females were directly trained. We have evidence that shows that when farms are operated by females, they're less likely to pay their dues, enter into water contracts, and be represented at irrigation planning meetings. That is not the case when farms are run by males who are not directly trained. And so sustaining participatory irrigation in Tajikistan depends on investing directly in female human capital. Because if a significant section of farms do not participate in a participatory system, it collapses for everybody. Male migration is extremely high in Tajikistan, um, as high as about 48% of rural households having a male migrant. And so one of the questions that we were really interested in, ans in asking was that when the, when, ma men, when the men leave, do women take over the activities that were traditionally performed by men, or do they hire other labor with the remittances that they're receiving from abroad? And what we really find is that there is a feminization of agriculture, but it is confined to labor-intensive tasks. Uh, and these results come from a study of almost 2,000 households in 80 sub-districts across 160 villages in southern Tajikistan. Uh, and we are comparing migrant households to other households. And these households, this, this particular study, this, this sample is representative of farms in southern Tajikistan. It's a stratified random sample of farms. And we find that in migrant households, women hire male laborers to perform mechanized tasks such as the preparing the soil and breaking down the soil and preparing the land for cultivation. In a small fraction of migrant households, women take on managerial tasks, such as purchasing inputs, hiring male laborers, attending war meetings. But in most migrant households, women take on the labor-intensive tasks, such as weeding, cotton harvesting, and irrigation. And these, this, this, this trend of feminization of labor-intensive tasks is seen on both types of production systems, the farms and the gardens. Farms were traditionally managed mostly by men. And when you, see, and when you look at labor-intensive tasks, such as breaking up the soil, we see that in the migrant households, uh, women don't perform these tasks. There's an increase in the proportion of the male, male members who are hired. And when it comes to tasks such as labor-intensive tasks, which is weeding the fields, even in non-migrant households, it's women who do the job but just more women jump into doing this job when the men leave. You don't hire men to perform labor-intensive tasks. You hire men to perform mechanized tasks. And, in, and it's the same trend that we see even for the kitchen gardens. So when we look at uh, participatory water governance, it involves shades of managerial duties, but also some labor-intensive duties. And so we wanted to understand what happens with participatory irrigation, what happens to female participation as men migrate. And what's important to note here is that farm managers were trained in participatory water governance in Tajikistan. Now, the manager of a farm is a, is a legal position. The name of the manager is mentioned on the title of the farm, and the title also lists the shareholders. And in Tajikistan, 98% of farmers are, of, of, uh, 98% of managers are male. So all training in participatory governance was pretty much imparted to men. And this is not an uncommon uh, program design. And the, and, and the reason for doing so comes from some of the evidence that comes from the agricultural economics literature, which talks about how male and lead farmers have stronger networks to diffuse information. And then training lead farmers with strong networks improves the cost effectiveness of trainings. 
However, in Tajikistan, as we said, farms are being operated by other workers. That is, they're being operated by people who are not managers. And what we know from our data is that about 30% of farms are operated by non-trained males, and 20% of farms are operated by non-trained females. And if participatory governance needs to be sustained, then information on governance needs to diffuse from managers who are trained to non-trained workers in the absence of the manager. And what we know about diffusion is that it's complex. It, in, diff, diffusion on information depends on a number of characteristics. It depends upon the complexity in, of the information. It depends on the density of trained farmers. It depends on the gender composition of the trained and the untrained group. And it depends upon farmer and farm characteristics. So there are no, there are, there, there is no guarantee that, that this might happen. It takes a combination of things to come together for diffusion to happen. And so we asked, does the, length of does the length of training affect participation in the water user associations itself at the farm level? And we find, yes, there is a positive effect. And this somewhat echoes, it's sort of the other side of the story to what Joe just presented. Joe was looking at, do the WUAs perform their mandated functions? This piece of the puzzle is looking at, do the members do what they're supposed to be doing? And we, and we find, yes, there is an effect of training on member participation. Is participation affected when farms operated by non-trained members? Not when they're male, but it's significantly lower when they're female. And this has implications for war functioning because information on what needs to be done, the way it's diffusing is not gender neutral. And these are potentially serious in a participatory, in a participatory uh, situation where at least 20% of farms are being run by women. So that's one fifth of members. So we adopt standard methodologies to establish causal relationships. Trying to understand the effects of training and the effects of gender on participation are complex for a number of reasons. For example, areas with longer training may historically have been more integrated into communities, which enable people to come together and for information to spread. Farms with uh, you know, the lowest capacity workers may be less likely to migrate because there needs to be some basic uh, minimum uh, capacity even to be able to get out of the country. Uh, females are likely to operate farms only when no other male is left, uh, which means that those may be different types of households and farms that we're talking about. And before these water user associations were created, there are no participatory institutions that existed. And what we end up doing is we end up controlling for all these factors through a bunch of methods, partly through the study design, partly through the data we collect, and partly through the types of econometric models that we run. Um, and so we, and, and to get the data in, we selected sub-districts where farms were imparted with longer and shorter training, but we selected them in matched pairs so that we made sure that they were uh, comparable. And we used historical data to select these sub-districts and matched pairs. In the selected sub-districts, we then uh, selected a stratified random sample of 2,000 farms. And to select those 2,000 farms, we ran our own census. And we implemented two surveys on, this, on the same set of 2,000 farms. The first was in 2015 to collect data for the 2014 uh, cropping year. And the second was in 2017 to collect data for the 2016 cropping year. And we perform an econometric estimation using difference and differences, which are slightly modified to account for all these different types of selection effects which may be in place. Those who are more interested in, in the details and the math behind how that happens, I would refer you to this paper. And these are the participation ind indicators that we collected. These participation indicators were, not, were, we collected these based on what the law states the farm is supposed to do. So the law, the WUA law states that the farm is supposed to pay its irrigation fees. Um, it's supposed to pay the membership fees for the calendar year. The farm is obliged to provide uh, workers towards routine cleaning and maintenance of the farms before the irrigation season uh, comes into place. And the law states that the farms should sign a contract with the Water User Association and advises the farm to attend the WUA meetings so that irrigation schedules and water budgets can be designed appropriately. In addition, we collected a bunch, we collected data on a bunch of other factors that might also drive participation. Uh, these are some of the factors that vary by time, such as you know, the, the number of females the number of female members, the, you know, the, air, the number of households that may be coming to work on the farms, um, the cultivated area, these are, these are parameters that change every year. And any of these could also drive participation. 
And there are factors which don't change over time, such as you know, the age of the farm and yeah, the distance of the farm from the road, which are time invariant, but can also drive participation. And so we, uh, so we control for both types of factors. And here's what we find. We find that longer training uh, just increases participation. So farms with longer training are 8% more likely to pay the membership fees. They are likely to provide seven more mandates of labor per farm uh, towards pre-irrigation uh, cleaning and maintenance. 20% more likely to sign a water contract, 9% more likely to attend the war meetings and participate in irrigation planning schedules. When farms are operated by non-trained males, which is the second um, um, red circle, we don't see any fall in participation. But when farms are operated by females, we see that they're 9% less likely to pay the membership fees, 11% less likely to sign a water contract, 3% less likely to attend uh, war meetings. And what are the implications of these results for war functioning? Non-payment of membership fees compromises the financial health of the Water User Association. There's less money left for the war to perform its routine tasks, so it affects operations. Not signing a water contract is really serious. District irrigation departments budget water requirements for a WUA based on the water contracts that farms sign with the water user associations. So if 20% of members do not, do not sign their water contracts, that automatically means that those requests for water are not being passed up the line and less water is going to be delivered to the farm. Not attending WUA meetings affects the uh, planning of irrigation schedules because if there are needs that need to be accommodated, those needs are not being represented at the water user association. What are the reasons for lower female participation? And this, these results come from focus group discussions with female irrigators. We conducted a series of them across Tajikistan with different numbers of females in per group. Women believe only managers can attend meetings. Non-managers are not allowed to attend WUA meetings. Uh, one of the reasons why women are less likely to participate when they manage a farm is because irrigation is often scheduled at midnight. It's an inconvenient time for them to come out and irrigate. So they feel less, less inclined to pay the membership fee because they believe the water is coming at a time when they can't even use it. Why should, they, why should they be paying for service? And they're not clear about the frequency and the purpose of the water contract. What is it for? Why is it important? That's not being communicated to them. These, uh, these are not beliefs held by men who are not directly trained. And so what, do we, what, do we, what, what, what does this tell us? What are the big takeaways out here? The first thing for policy purposes or for programming purposes would be to clarify the water user association law. Because the law does not prevent a shareholder from attending a meeting. But the law needs to be clarified there. Training female farmers directly. Uh, relying on trained male farmers to diffuse information to both non-trained males and females is not working. The information networks don't seem to be gender neutral or are split around lines of gender at least. Training water user associations to cope with changing demographics. As more and more women start managing farms, and if irrigation is going to be scheduled at, at midnight, does the irrigation need to be scheduled at a different time? Or do, you, do we need to maybe have arrangements where membership fees could be used to hire male workers to irrigate at midnight? What kinds of those cooperative arrangements might the WUA take into place in order to help female irrigators irrigate? And finally, building the capacity of district irrigation departments, WUAs don't uh, operate in isolation. And having some sort of a WUA liaison officer at the district irrigation department level, which provides water to the water user association, may also help um, cope with these changing and trying times. So I'll stop with that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was very, yeah, very interesting and, and great recommendations. All right, we have time for a two or three questions um, from our in-person and online audiences before we move on to our final speaker. I'll pass the mic over to Sylvia. I guess I should out myself as the gender advisor for the water office in E3. <laughs> um, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts about land tenure as a way to um, compensate for the law that um, uh, farm managers are um, the designated representative of the um, of the farm. Um, I know Tajikistan is a former Soviet um, yeah. country, but um, I would like to hear if there's been any any thought about that, especially in terms of joint titling, since the husband is not there. Right. Uh, I can. I'll briefly answer that question, but I'll also direct this to Katie as well. Uh, 
nobody can own land in Tajikistan. You only have the right to possess it and use it. And sorry, uh, uh, it's not a cooperative anymore because the the, co the the collective farms have been broken down. So these are individual private farms. So it's usually the farm is about three to four hectares hectares in size. It's there's a manager of the farm who holds the title to the farm, and then there are shareholders. And the shareholders are typically blood relatives. So we're talking about husband, wife, uh, adult children. Uh, as far as I'm aware, you can't own the land, so you can't sell it. And it's hard, and there is there isn't much of a rental market that we see either. Katie, do you do you want to talk a little bit about inheritance and how that works, and uh, how women are sort of disadvantaged in that in that inheritance story? So just briefly, you asked a little bit about joint titling and if that's possible. And so right now, there isn't joint titling. So you just have one document that shows possession of the land. And so they get land in basically 50-year leases or inheritable leases since it can't be owned. And that can be transferred. So if the man migrates, he can transfer it to um, his wife or you know daughter or daughter-in-law. But that uh, requires paperwork and kind of being able to access di district center, have the right ID documents, um, be able to kind of go through that formal procedure. So depending on you know people's income level, their education level, in rural areas, there's also a problem where women don't have identification documents often. And so all of that kind of has to be in place in order to formally transfer that title over. And that, has happened and so a lot of the increase that we see right now in women managing farms is a result of their you know husbands migrating and then kind of whether they like it or not they end up as the head of a farm and so it, they you know in terms of joint titling and changing land tenure we also have to keep in mind that you know some of these women might not necessarily want to be farm managers but it's a job that they're kind of pushed into they might have had other occupations before but it's something that they've kind of had to take on. So there's kind of varying levels of enthusiasm among women in terms of taking on this role and you know what that means and also for irrigation and participating in this really you know difficult it's a huge time burden that they're taking on. I think it's also fair to say that I mean most of our work was quantitative so we didn't so but in terms of at least some of the qualitative work that we've done it's it's not uncommon that if all the men in the household leave farms are left fallow and production instead is focused on the kitchen garden and in part it's a convenient story because the kitchen gardens are right adjacent to the house the farms are far away you have to walk to them but it's also in part maybe driven by uh, just a story of the garden has always historically been of the household so you know this is this is this is yours you you farm this the land the farm is a relatively new concept you know these are basically the pieces of former collective farms so in terms of you know what do you think is more secure. I think it seems to be the case that people find the gardens to be more secure because it's always been theirs and this is new and everyone's still trying to adjust to what that means. Okay. I'll pass it back to our online audience for a question. Uh, yes, so we have a few good questions that came in during um, the presentation. We have one from Hamisu Samari who says, can lower female participation also stem from cultural beliefs? at least in some parts of the world, that only men should be involved in major decision-making events. Um, also from Don Van Atta, the Tajik law on Wuas used to specify that only commercial farms could be um, Wua members, so households were cut out by design. Has that situation changed? Uh, both really good questions. Uh, the first question is really important. Absolutely, it is culture that drives where people feel comfortable doing what they're doing. So that means that if you're, if that, so, so there's two things happening. There's, there's a cultural context where women did X and men did Y, and that's become a sort of, it's, it's cultural, that's our culture. But economics kicks in and then the men leave, and then the women have to step into these other roles, whether they like it or not, whether the men like it or not, whether the women like it or not. So because of that existing culture, information doesn't cross gender lines. So in a sense, the w one necessary but not sufficient way to uh, increase the capacities of women is to change the design of training programs. Uh, it, it, simply training the men and expecting them to tell their wives 
is not going to necessarily cut it. I think that's the moral of the story. And that is culture. That is culture. Um, in terms of the second question, uh, kitchen gardens are still not legally members of water user associations. That remains the case. Uh, there is some talk going on in Tajikistan about looking at the possibility of whether it's possible to bring them in. We don't know what's going on out there. There seems to be, I mean, we don't, there's nothing that we know about formally. But at the moment, as they stand, kitchen gardens are not members of WUAs, only farms are. And as Joe's presentation uh, made the point, there are all types of arrangements that village leaders who typically oversee the kitchen gardens enter into uh, uh, enter into different types of agreements or different types of informal arrangements with water user associations to negotiate water use for the kitchen gardens. So they continue to not be legal members. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good morning. My name is Firdaus Kabilov, a lawyer based in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. I did some legal research. Um, my contribution was uh, analyzing legislative framework of, of war law in, in, in Tajikistan. Um, I, my interpretation of the law would suggest, uh, well, as, as you see the law, kitchen gardens are, cannot be legally members of, of wars. But there is something in the law which says uh, war members, commercial farmers, and individual entrepreneurs can become a war members. Uh, now, kitchen gardens, if they are engaged in commercial activities beyond generating food for their own cons consumption, they can be classified as, as, as individual entrepreneurs. But this doesn't serve their interests, because if you classify yourself under the law as an entrepreneur, then you have to pay taxes. So they don't, they don't, they try not to classify themselves as entrepreneurs, thus they cannot become um, war members. But, but if, if you interpret the law as the way I did, there's a way that kitchen gardens can be incorporated as a war members, if, if that makes sense. Does it? Yeah. I'll just touch a little bit on the other, the gender component question that was asked. And so there, is um, from the focus groups we did, there is a definite sense that um, women feel as though they're maybe less welcome in water user association meetings, particularly when they're male dominated. And part of this, you know, is stemming from the fact that, as Somia mentioned, as other mentioned, irrigation really has been a male dominated task throughout the Soviet Union. And so women feel that they have this lack of background knowledge. And since they haven't been physically engaged with the task as much, then it makes it challenging for them to kind of step into that role and feel as though their voice is going to be heard and respected in that same sense. And so that really comes back to where um, Somia's emphasis on the need to um, have training. And sorry, I forgot to say my name. My name is Katie McDonald, and I worked as a research assistant. Great, thank you. And I'll pass it over to Aviva. Um, thanks so much, everyone. I've really enjoyed this presentation. My name is Aviva Kutnik. I'm a USAID uh, Foreign Service Officer. And I uh, served as an agriculture officer in Tajikistan from 2012 to 15. And so really delighted to see this type of rigorous evaluation work. I wanted to just make two quick clarification points. Uh, one is just that, and this is likely understood, but just on the programming uh, implementation of training, it's not as if that was intentionally a male-centered yeah. training, yeah. but rather that training was for uh, leaders and managers of the WUA, yep. which of course do happen to be primarily male, but just an important programming note. Um, and then I also wanted to note, Sylvia, thank you for bringing up um, all of these important questions of, of gender and culture and the overlap with our um, land reform, land titling, and land use training programming, which was explicitly uh, directed towards women farmers and females. And so the kind of larger picture was that we, as we hoped more women would gain land titles, land use rights, that they would then become more prominent and leaders in the WUA structure. So just a, a brief point of clarification there I thought would be, would be useful. Thank you. That, that, no, that's very useful. And we didn't mean, and there was no intention to say that it was intentional. It's just most agriculture, agricultural extension programs focus on training lead farmers. It's, it's not at all uncommon, and there, are, and there are reasons, good reasons to do it as well. Yeah. 
one more quick comment. I'm Josue from BFS. Uh, I uh, have a quick question. What kind of training uh, f or the focus of the training that USA uh, conduct? Yeah. Is uh, on water use or any, any other aspects of uh, crop production? That's what the next presentation is going to be about. So uh, I don't want to steal my, my colleague's thunder here, but uh, the USA training is focused on water governance, water participation, as well as um, diversification, um, alternative crop uh, cultivation techniques, better seeds. And I'll, but I'll, I'll let Marie talk about that. Oh, and that's a great segue into our final presentation by Marie Solat Puissant. Yeah, so thank you for the transition. OK. So yes, thank you for this question, which make a perfect transition for this last presentation. Uh, the question here is traditional farming or high-value high crops? This is obviously the type of question that each farmer of at some point to answer. And our findings show that a comprehensive approach is actually the way to, or the good way to help tajik farmers to choose their, their cropping pattern and to answer this question. So the main takeaways of what I will present to you now. First of all, uh, cultivating cotton for cash and wheat for food is the dominant pattern in uh, South Tajikistan, but faces a number of risks. Second, diversification of crops can support income and food uh, diversification, but so far faces a number of constraints. Uh, third, the farms serve, ser served by USID supported water user association benefited from water services as well as from agricultural extension services. And finally, our results uh, show uh, that improved irrigation services boost staple production, while diversification into high-value crops requires both water services and agricultural extension services. Uh, let me start by showing you a few graphics to, so that you better understand what is the, the big picture of agriculture in this part of Tajikistan and what the cropping patterns are. So in this first graphic, you see the percentage of farms cultivating different crops. And you very quickly see what the major dominant cropping pattern is. Uh, farmers cultivate cotton, and they cultivate wheat. Uh, we have around 60% of the farms cultivating cotton, and 64% of the farms cultivating wheat. And then you have a number of few other crops, well, in, in this graph, you only have few of them, but there is a, really a large diversity. But these crops are cropped by only some farms, some farmers, and they are clearly much less developed than this dominant wheat and, and cotton cultivation uh, system. Then when you look about the areas covered with the different type of crops, here again, you have the same picture of cotton and wheat, especially cotton, I would say, in terms of areas covered by the crop. Um, well, on average, in our survey, we have farms uh, which are of five hectares. And here you see that you have uh, more than three hectares which are used for cotton only. So this is clearly these farms, this commercial farm, are primary um, using the land to grow uh, cotton, and then secondly, to grow, to grow wheat. And then here again, all these different uh, other crops, yes, they are there, but in terms of the share of the area that they are covering, uh, those uh, shares are very limited. Well, then what do they do with these crops which are cultivating in the farm? And, and here, the story is very clear. Cotton is for cash. Uh, the entire cotton production is obviously sold on the market. Wheat is mostly for food, which is kept for self-consumption. So this is what, they, what 
farmers used to say uh, they couldn't for cash and wait for food. Uh, but then what is really interesting is that if you look at what's happened for all these other crops, which are less present in the farms, then the picture is really more balanced. So part of the harvest is kept uh, for self-consumption, and part of the harvest is uh, sold. So here, well, what, what we see here is that with these other crops to want more diversification, then there, there is something like an opportunity both for income and potentially poverty reduction, and both for food and potentially uh, malnutrition reduction, for example. Okay, let me coming back to this traditional uh, farming system, which is the cotton for cash and wheat for food. Why this system in place? Uh, first of all, cotton. Well, cotton is the second highest export earner of the country. So this is a key sector in the country. Cotton is so important uh, at the macroeconomic uh, level. The farm price are regulated and the harvest are purchased by a small number of companies. What we saw uh, in our an analysis is that at the farm level, cotton profitability is rather limited or even negative. But then what's happened? Why are they still doing cotton? Well, first of all, cultivating cotton beside the cotton fiber, which is sold, uh, also provide stroke, which are used for eating and which are also used uh, for livestock as fodder, for example. So this is still important in, in the rural communities to use this um, secondary product of the harvest. Um, and then there is all this system of debt and leakages uh, between the farms and what they call the future companies. Then you have all this network uh, between influential people and farms, which also explain why farms will go for cotton. And then you have this system of community norm, which is that you, you obviously will go again and again for cotton in spite in the, of this limited profitability. So this is the cotton sector. On the other side, wheat. Well, wheat and bread is a staple food in, in Tajikistan. This is really the main surf, source of nutrition. Um, then it's also important to have in-country uh, production of wheat because, the because of the fluctuating prices of imported uh, wheat. And because of that, the government has really a policy supporting uh, wheat production, uh, which is there in place since uh, several years. And de facto, since uh, the, the independence and all the reforms on, on the agricultural system, we saw uh, a surge in the wheat uh, cultivation, so the areas under wheat has more than doubled uh, since the independence. But still, so far, 40% um, of the wheat consumed is uh, imported from surrounding countries. So wheat is really important, as well as cotton here. And yet, there are a number of risks with these two crops, cotton and wheat. The first risk is the one of climate change. Uh, which is obviously in place it's in Central Asia uh, region, and it's likely to see the production of wheat and even more likely of cotton uh, to be fallen in the in the coming years, for example. Uh, simply because cotton is a highly water dependent crops, so which means that cotton cultivation is uh, vulnerable to water availability, obviously through the state of the infrastructure which is not good so far, but which will also require huge uh, investment in future. Uh, it's also dependent to the energy costs, which are likely uh, to rise in futures as the subsidies for energy will fall down. And this is obviously vulnerable to the institutional uh, environment because of the governance uh, central world. Then I explain you that cotton market is not profitable so far at the farm level. And finally, the alternative risk uh, mechanism which could help farmers uh, are, are not in place in our context. So for example, forward markets, crop insurance are so far very limited uh, in Tajikistan. So this was the situation on the traditional cropping pattern weight cotton. On the other side, we clearly have opportunities to more diversified cropping pattern and to high value crops. 
Well, the opportunities are simply that the introduction of diversity would meet varied uh, sources of income with potentially a reduction in production. And on the other side, more diversified food intake with potentially a reduction in malnutrition, at least bringing more diversity in food intake. But here again, there are a number of constraints which are in place and which explain that these high hiding crops are not so well developed. So first of all, there is limited dissemination technologies in place. Agricultural extension services are not well developed. Uh, there is a lack of input market for these alternative crops. Uh, there is limited credit facilities, uh, which also link to uh, the land market, which is quasi inexistent, as we mentioned before. Uh, cold storage and processing facilities are not in place. And finally, we, we still see uh, an important volatility in the prices of these vegetables, for example. So yes, there are some opportunities with new crops, but there are also a number of constraints which explain why it's not so well developed uh, as of now. OK, so this was the big picture of the, the context and the agricultural production which is there in place so far. So from there, this was our evaluation question. Well, obviously, uh, the primary objective of water user association would be to manage water through operation and through maintenance, and on the basis on a decentralized uh, participatory and multi-sectoral governance structure. This being said, we can surely expect water user association to influence other components of agricultural decision. And that was our question of interest. We wanted to see what's happened and what the role of water user association on farmers' decision. So we wondered to which extent uh, WUA influenced the crop choices made by the farmers, and to what extent WUA uh, tend to reinforce this uh, cotton for cash, wheat for food model, or tend to strengthen diversification uh, toward high value crops. Well, we did this analysis uh, using two rounds of survey uh, in 2015 and 2017 with um, almost uh, 2,000 farmers. So we split our sample with treating farms and controlled farms. The idea was that we had two groups of farms which are similar so that we can compare them. They were selected uh, using a matching technique, and then we also add a proportional random sampling. Uh, a key point is also that the intervention was not considered as one package, but was split into different type of intervention because there were actually water delivery services and agricultural extension services. So here are our results. And first of all, I show you the determinants of crop choice for uh, cotton and wheat. So here's what we see. Uh, water delivery services partly determine the cultivated area of cotton and wheat. So for example, a better perception of water sharing is associated with the cultivation of additional hectares of cotton. But on the other side, farmers that perceive an improvement in the quantity of water which is delivered uh, tend to uh, cultivate less wheat. This is for water delivery. And for uh, agricultural extension services, we don't see any impact on the crop choice toward cotton and wheat. We did the same thing for the other crops in terms of the number of crops and uh, of the areas covered by the other crops. Here's what we see. So water delivery services, especially through infrastructure rehabilitation, um, underpin farmers' decision toward more crop diversification. So for example, a better perception of the condition of the water course is associated with the cultivation of 0 and 15 additional crops on the farm. Beside water delivery services, agricultural extension services have also an impact on shaping uh, the cropping pattern toward uh, more diversified crops. So farms that receive formal agricultural training, uh, they cultivate more crops. And farms uh, that interact more often between their same, that's what we call informal training, then here again, they, can, they, tend, to, they tend to cultivate uh, larger areas with other crops. Well, finally, 
uh, we did the same analysis uh, with cropping intensity and diversification indexes. And here, again, the story is that infrastructure rehabilitation has a positive effect on cropping intensity and on diversity index. So, for example, a better perception of the condition of the water course is associated with an increase of 3% on the cropping intensity and training of the farm members on agricultural practices and technologies is also a positive determinant of diversification. So farmers who benefited from the formal training, then they tend to have more diversified cropping pattern. So the big picture of this result is that, yes, water services are, have an impact on the traditional cropping pattern. It has an influence. But if you consider water services together with agricultural services, then they will both uh, help the farmer to, to choose more diversified uh, cropping pattern. So from here, those are two main recommendations that we can make. So first, water governance should be considered as one of the agricultural challenges in the project design fa phase and not be isolated. This is really one piece of the puzzle. So in, in the present case, USID uh, designed its water support program to address water as well as other agricultural uh, challenges, and it was key. The second point is that a comprehensive approach um, should be able to widen the range of the potential impact. This is what we see here. Uh, instead of water-only services, uh, the, the beneficiaries benefited also from agricultural extension services. And because of that, it not only uh, support them in their actual practice, but also give them the opportunity to make choices to move from this actual practice toward more diversity in their cropping choices. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to bring up Ted Horvalik for some final comments before we open it up for a few additional questions uh, for Mari Charlotte and for the panel. Uh, so. Okay, I just have a few quick um, reflections really on what we've heard, helping people to sort of put some of this in perspective and also to maybe extend their thinking about how this might apply in other contexts or with other interventions. And so really I want to make sort of three observations. And the first one is that the work we're hearing described here presents sort of a real world laboratory of a lot of data and a chance to analyze what's, what's happening. And you might say, well, why is that important? Um, the economist in me wants to say, well, this should be highly predictable, that under uh, fairly standard conditions and all else being equal, if you make water more readily available and more secure, you'd expect to see some adjustments like the use of more water, the production of more crops which are more intensive, and the magnitudes of these changes are fairly easily predicted by using some well-known information about various crop production practices. But as we can see here, those usual conditions and all else being equal don't really hold. All of this is playing out in an environment where there's uh, labor market adjustments, migration uh, of males moving away. Uh, this is an environment where the move from collectivized farming practices is fairly recent. And so the ability of, of markets to convey signals to people, the ability of, of the individual farmers to, to make that adjustment, should I stop growing cotton and do something else, uh, there's not a lot of history and tradition of doing that. And so that's where by going and saying, let's actually find out how much of this is happening on the ground, some work would proceed largely with qualitative approaches. And, and this work has used both qualitative and quantitative work um, to go there and use focus group discussions and key informant interviews and say, what can we learn about people's intentions, the reactions, how they feel about this, what they're thinking of doing. But this work benefits from going further. And the big focus here is, as, as they've been describing, is we've actually got a lot of information about actual choices. Through the cross-sectional analysis, we can describe what people are actually doing. And through the time series approach, we can describe the changes in what they're actually doing. So this work is founded um, by uh, having enough data that we can really say something about the choices people are actually making. It's not about thoughts and perceptions and predictions. It's these are the choices they're actually making. And so 
with only a, a few years between surveys, we have to focus on those short-run impacts. But it really does provide a laboratory of evidence. And, and I would argue that in thinking about evaluating th these kinds of interventions, the ability to have that sort of data foundation. So when we're thinking about, as we've seen here, adjustments as some of these producers start to move away from cotton or wheat, uh, these are small producers, three or four hectares. For them to move a quarter of a hectare or half a hectare into some new crop is a large, uh, a large decision on their part. And what we can show statistically is this just isn't random noise, that through a well-designed representative sample across thousands of farms representing the whole district, that these, uh, we can test hypotheses. This is not random noise. These are significant changes. Uh, these are actual decisions that we're seeing happening and, and, uh, and give us some confidence to, to make the recommendations that we're seeing. Along the way, um, we've actually had to adjust some methodologies because unlike some other kinds of uh, feed, the, feed the Future interventions where we're potentially introducing a crop variety or something, you can say, well, here's the continuing practice and here's the treatment practice or the change and let's compare them. This was a wholesale change. And so there aren't the collectivized systems continuing. It's uh, finding some way to set up the comparables and have a valid, valid presentation. And, and uh, that work has been well received in the papers that were published. The second point I wanted to make is that as you think about this focus on community-based organizations, water user associations, you really shouldn't, you should be careful not to think of them too much in isolation. Uh, and so um, as we've explained here, a member of the project team who introduced himself, uh, Firdavs Kabilov, has published a paper describing the legal institutions. And so in the background here, and he's available to take questions about this when the, when the time comes, I mean, many of us think about this region of concerns around the ARLC and water depletion and, and harmful, harmful effects of cotton production on the environment and so on. What would be the implications of country-to-country uh, -country agreements on water use? What would be the effects, you know, which takes precedence? These local laws, the Constitution, those sorts of things, where do we stand with that? So to really understand investments in water user associations, you need that large, larger picture. And so analyses like those ones ask a series of questions. You know, who really makes the decisions about the water um, as it flows from through the system, um, and at the same time, where does the money go? Who, who collects the money? What money? What financial flows are involved with these water decisions? Who has the authority to, to use and to both spend and receive those funds? And so um, that idea of looking at the whole system as you focus on the water user associations uh, can reveal a, lot, re reveal a lot, as in the suggestions we're seeing here, that having made some big gains in water user associations, are there other opportunities to increase the capacity of the other related stakeholders, the water districts, the village councils, local governments, and so on, are they capable in this new environment of being the ones to interact with the water user associations? Perhaps they need or would benefit from some help too. The last point I wanted to comment on was this large theme we've heard about women's roles, feminization of agriculture, uh, largely motivated by these concerns about um, migration. And um, in time, this, this study has focused on a lot of short-term effects. In time, we'll want to look at some of the longer-term effects of how is this played out in terms of people's income levels and welfare and, and, and general levels of food security and economic well-being. One of the important considerations here is how women use their time. And so in some part, uh, or in some real, very real sense, uh, time is an important part of people's uh, budgets and incomes and how they use that time. And one of the things we're seeing, as was described in the question and answer, is that a whole bunch of duties are being forced upon households that really weren't anticipating them or necessarily eager to undertake them. And so it's not just a theoretical observation, but an actual observation that in many cases, uh, families are saying, no, we can't do it all. We're going to leave the lands lie idle and so on. And so uh, we shouldn't be scratching our heads later to say, you know, how come with all this investment, these lands aren't being cultivated the way they used to? Uh, a big part of it is that people's uh, time and the ability of the shift of, of, of burdens and roles isn't playing out to people's advantage. They're saying, no, we're going to make uh, rational choices for ourselves. So very important to focus on those aspects to understand both what's happened so far and what we're going to see coming in the future. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ted. And uh, let's give a round of applause to all of our speakers. We have about five minutes or so left for questions, and I'll encourage everyone in the room to also continue to um, ask questions directly of the speakers after we close the event. And I also just wanted to ask the in-person participants, there are some surveys on your tables. It's always helpful to us to have you fill those out 
um, to support our shaping of future AgriLinks events. All right, so I'll open it up for a few questions with in person and online before we wrap up. Dick, Dick Tinsley, a agronomist, water management specialist from Colorado State University, which is one of the leading irrigation universities, and did initiate the Water Users Association programs uh, originally in Pakistan based on the uh, farmer ditch companies of Colorado. Anyway, also, I have been in Tajikistan and looked at the irrigation system there and had quite a few things of concern. First, it looked like the system was designed originally for large farms, as in your corporate system, and then broken up into small farms. That's a totally different management structure. It takes a lot more. The result was a tremendous amount of vandalism. And the system had been vandalized, a lot of the control structures, as farmers not operating coordinated with the large farms were desperately trying to get water. And the end result of that was a <coughs> was the uh, water that was right was too small, and it's the only place in the world I've seen a stalled irrigation waterfront. That means the water was, with not enough water, was entering the field, or entering the furrows, actually, to get through the field, and it was stalled about two-thirds of the way down, and was not getting here. That's not a very good thing. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, there's a lot of problems. I hope the, this has been corrected. Uh, I was there as a F2F program about six years ago. Um, the other thing that impressed me there was it looked like the land sizes as they had been broken down were not really economically viable. And therefore, the idea of male migrating out and going into Russia looking for job is probably a very good thing. But leaving behind what happened to the land, the wife cannot manage the same amount of land as a husband and wife, and I got the impression that this land may be being converted back into a large holding, perhaps on a some type of a informal rental agreement. And either that or it was being left out. And I'll, I'll let you try to answer that question. Um, but I suspect that that is actually a better, more economic use of it. Um, thus, the kitchen gardens are, you know, just very small plots. They're, yes, they're outside of that, and they do need water. But there's a, the way to have to get them, I'm not certain of. But the water, the irrigation system was basically in a total sense of collapse when I was there. So that was, a, that was a very big concern because of design for one system being applied to another system. OK, I, I'll, I'll stop there and continue later. Thanks for those observations. And I don't know if you have any further comments on those? Uh, uh, all valid observations. Yes, uh, I think uh, infrastructure was vandalized. There was, there has been a consorted effort to rehabilitate some of that infrastructure, both by USAID, by the government, and by other donors. Our, our evaluation was looking at the impacts of what you might call, quote, unquote, soft investments. And we were not looking, I mean, some of the effects of infrastructure rehabilitation come into looking at crop, uh, crop services, and you find that definitely the physical uh, quality of the infrastructure has an effect on what you grow. So some of that rehabilitation did take place. But it's difficult. We know it's difficult maintaining infrastructure in this landscape. Water user associations often do complain even now that they don't have enough money to do the routine cleaning and maintenance that they need to do. Um, you know, it's not, there isn't a lot of, um, you know, the money, there's two types of fees. There's a membership fee that the WUA retains to, main, to, to conduct routine cleaning and maintenance. And then there's an irrigation fee, which is collected by the WUA, but it's sent to the district irrigation department. There is definitely, uh, I think, some lack of clarity on how those different fees, especially the fees that's transferred to the government, is used. So I think all your observations are, are, are valid. It's true that the kitchen gardens are an important source of uh, food. Uh, in, in the water user association system, because of the law and the fact that it reads as, you know, the only uh, commercial entities can be members, they are not, de 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 they're definitely not members. So there are all types of these informal arrangements that exist, including, you know, uh, taking pipes from canals and putting them into kitchen gardens. Some of these arrangements are uh, put into place, you know, in cooperation between villages and the wars. Others not so much. So um, I think they're all valid. I think they're all uh, very valid observations, yeah. I was 
just going to really quickly answer your question about the land movement and people trying to make plot size homes larger, which is happening. So, you know, informally, anecdotally, when people can't take their land anymore, or, you know, it's just a woman and she's managing it by herself, she might give it to a neighbor that's happened, and so they increase their plot size. And there are larger operated, almost like collective farms, but there are some very large farms that are increasingly taking on land. And so, and those are actually becoming a huge problem for the water user associations because they're quite powerful and they don't want to be members for the water user association. So there is that kind of dynamic that's happening and could continue to happen in the future if things become more centralized under large farms. You mean like what, the US? Yes. Like Colorado Parks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I'm going to toss it back to our online audience for one final question before we wrap up. OK, I'm going to try to make it two quick questions one then. Uh, so we have from Mila Chaloba, um, what control measure are there in terms of ensuring access to water by members uh, is transparent and that the governance structure is acceptable since there is no membership or legal requirement for water users association members to access the water in their kitchen gardens. Um, and also um, Nargiza Lutgate says, did WUA receive other support from USAID besides training, uh, funds for irrigation and drainage rehabilitation, including um, building control structures, et cetera? Uh, it, the answer to the second question is yes. There was physical rehabilitation. There were control structures. Gates were replaced. So there's a whole bunch of comprehensive, heavy infrastructure um, um, investments which happened, both for USA and in other wars as well, because as, as, as you pointed out, these systems were, um, you know, that collapsed after the Soviet Union disintegrated in part due to vandalism. So yes, all systems were physically rehabilitated. Um, uh, the, first, um, the first part of the question was around the water user association, I think, and, and the relationship between the wars and the kitchen gardens. Yeah. And, um, Kitchen gardens are not legal members of water user associations, and as such, you know, there is no formal way to quote unquote regulate what they do. So in, in order to sort of manage water use between different users and different users, um, usually in most cases, these sorts of informal mechanisms typically come into place where the village leaders who oversee the kitchen plots enter into ag informal agreements on who's going to use water at what time with water user associations. It takes place in some places, but there are landscapes where there is no talking to one another, and that's where you see the conflicts um, I increasing. In some cases, we have seen uh, written papers on the gardens are going to use water at this time, and the farms are going to use water at this time, and this is how we're going to play nice with each other. But there's a variety of arrangements ranging from, you know, formal to informal to none. So, it, and, th and that's really the challenge here. How do you really coordinate multiple use across multiple users? Yeah. And, and I think that the question was also about the transparency of the yeah. water allocation. Um, well, the transparency exists uh, for the for the farms user of, of of water simply because they they have to ask uh, for for water. They will say that I need to irrigate uh, x hectares of uh, cotton at this time, and then uh, the the WUA leaders will collect all this demand, and then they will be able to provide a calendar on when the water uh, will come to whom. So on this side, there is transparency, but on the other side, obviously for the kitchen garden, because they have no they are not the members, then we, we don't know what is flowing to them and how much they are actually using, et cetera. Um, and remind that we are also in a system where obviously there is no water measuring, so we don't actually know what is the quantity of water arriving to the, to the different yeah. level. All right, wonderful, thank you. We are gonna go ahead and officially wrap up. Thank you all very much for attending. Thank you to our online audience. And please be on the lookout for uh, the recording from this event and also for the final report from this impact evaluation. Uh, and some additional blog posts and resources highlighting various stories from this impact evaluation through AgriLinks. So thank you very much, and we'll see you.